Hi, and welcome to Staying Connected. I'm Jay Burney, and we are very happy today to uh, bring to everyone a good friend and a colleague, Margaret Wooster. Um, Margaret and I have been friends for a long time. I first met Margaret when she was uh, executive director of Great Lakes United. That's going back uh, quite a long time, but we've done a lot of work together. Um, she is um, a marvelous thinker, leader, writer about water issues, and she has a new book, but it's called Meander. And so Margaret, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Jay, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, this is a great new book, and I know that it's not your first book. Uh, you've written several, um, and they've all been profoundly moving, uh, full of knowledge. And this one, Meander, it's about water. Uh, and it's a stunning subject that you know we, we all, I think, more or less take for granted. But you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, you know, I'm talking to the audience now, water is life. Water is everything. So let's talk about meander, Margaret. What, what is, uh, why did you name it meander and what does that mean? Um, well, going back to the three books, I, I just realized recently um, where, me, you know, why, why I wrote Meander, which, which is um, the first book was Somewhere to Go on Sunday. It was a, a guidebook, but, but, you know, just a, a guidebook to natural areas in Western New York, um, how to get there, what you'll see when you're there, but, you know, pretty much a guidebook. Uh, the second book was Living Waters, and that sort of picked on eight streams across New York State from the Buffalo River, Niagara River, all the way over to the St. Lawrence River. And that started to get in more depth um, into the story of this these particular rivers. And then Meander came along because um, what's happening to our rivers and specifically to this Oxbow um, wetland that was cut off, it's a cut off meander from the Buffalo uh, Creek. And, um, and when they cut it off, uh, a sequence of, of problems began and is still happening. There have been deaths at the, uh, at the, at the low head dams that they had to put into the river to slow the velocity, uh, which had increased because they cut off this long meander, which is basically just a curve in the river. Um, and um, meandering, as it turns out, as I found out doing the research for this book, is uh, essential to what rivers do. Uh, because it is all about the stability of a river in the landscape that meanders to attain its its um, its uh, optimum flow. Uh, it's all about the exchange of water with the land. The meander increases rather than a straight line from A to B, which no river, there is no such river. Um, uh, when they meander, they increase the contact with the earth and with the exchange of minerals and, um, and nutrients. Um, so meandering is um, really important. And in a way, I'll just say lastly, uh, when, when, I, when you go back to the Clean Water Act or the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, both agreements um, designed to, to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the water, and that's because we've already had some serious problems with our Great Lakes waters. Um, when they say we want to restore and maintain chemical, physical, and biological, we've we've talked a lot in our society about chemical and biological, you know, the toxic issues in the Great Lakes from the industrialization. Um, and biological, you know, the, a lot of the work to restore has been uh, planting habitat or trying to preserve habitat. But physical um, integrity of the waters has never really been unpacked. And um, it's often the, still the first thing to go when, when we're working in or around a river. Um, and so meander is key to physical integrity. So in some sense, you know, um, the book is meant to lift up this uh, importance of, um, of the physical integrity of our rivers that we have to, we can't just move them around at will uh, without dire consequences to our ecology, to our environment, to our, to our water. You know, I, I do want to talk with you about the Oxbow in a few minutes, but I want to talk a little bit more about meandering and about how 
basically humans have manipulated uh, water systems like rivers and creeks, and um, that eliminates the meanders. So um, the fact that we, why do we do that? Why do we manipulate waterways? Because, you know, we are always seeking more land. Uh, we always want more land, more developable land. And um, when the oxbow was cut off, uh, it was a big, deep meander on Buffalo Creek. Uh, it was just this, just upstream from the city of Buffalo in the town of West Seneca. And, um, you know, it was, I asked a lot of people, why did this happen? It took 10 years. Um, it was hand dug the new channel, which, you know, sort of connected where the meander started and where the meander came back in. So it was a sort of connect, making a straightaway instead of this big loop. And, um, and this, you know, it depended on who you talked to. Everybody had a different story of why was this done. But as far as I can say, tell, um, the effect of it was um, it had something to do with, uh, with um, slowing erosion and slowing um, sedimentation downstream for the navigable channel of the Buffalo River, which the Army Corps of Engineers manages and dredges every two years. And they were blaming this meander in part um, on um, delivering sediment downstream. And so the meander had to go, but that was crazy because the whole, the whole purpose or the whole effect of the oxbow was to store sediment to what, you know, when, when you have these curves in a river, you know, it's going back and forth and there's a deposition area and, and a, um, and a pickup area. And the oxbow was a de deposition area for sediment. So it was actually containing sediments rather than, um, you know, adding to the load downstream. But, you know, the outcome, uh, the first outcome and the most visible outcome on the land of cutting off that meander was um, subdivisions went in into the floodplain. When we straighten rivers, which is also called channelizing rivers, we're often doing it to create um, more land for whatever development commercial, residential, whatever. And so uh, people feel falsely that this, you know, there's no longer uh, this meander. Um, the floodplain is perhaps not there anymore. And um, and so the, the immediate consequence when, when this meander was cut off um, in the, I think it was finished in 1959, uh, the next year there was a flood and um, well, a subdivision went in and then, and then came a flood and, um, and that subdivision has been flooded seriously um, three or four times since. So we, we do it, um, we channelize rivers to make more land, to make more, uh, to get more development. Um, and um, we are not really thinking about the physical integrity of the flow of water and what it needs to remain stable in the landscape. Flooding is a natural thing rivers do, they're supposed to do. It's what they do that, that actually supports the life on the land. The term oxbow uh, may not be familiar to all of our uh, listeners out there today. Um, I know that you've done a lot of work on this particular oxbow in West Seneca. It's a natural feature. Can you just describe what an oxbow is a little bit more? Yeah, an oxbow is a big bend in a river, and um, it's got its name because of you know if you think of the yoke that uh, the yoke that would be put over an oxen to pull a cart, a sort of U-shaped oak yoke that uh, you know that fitted over the the ox's shoulders. Um, that's what these that that's what these meanders. Um, often look like they're they're like big open U's um, or or yokes. And um, they um, they really are uh, they're part of the way in which a river designs itself and designs the land around it because they they occur because um, the flowing water is picking up sediment and depositing sediment. And when it hits any kind of obstacle, even if it's a, a boulder or something small, it begins to um, drop its sediment on the um, on the slower moving side. Water isn't one continuous flow; it's sort of braided. So there's a lot of there's a lot of 
individual flows within a flow. Um, so deposition or dropping of the sediments happens uh, where it's slower and increases where it's faster. And that physics of water flow causes these meanders to grow. Um, so, you know, where the slower water is accumulating sediment, um, that becomes greater and greater until you have, I wish I should, I, should, I need a, a little poster border here to, to draw, but, you know, so you, you have the, you have this accumulation of sediment and then you have this, you know, erosion happening farther out and it's carving out more and more and then depositing it downstream at a, at a deposition point. So that's how meanders work. And all of that is um, important because it creates habitat. It cre this, you know, there are creatures that need the slow moving water. There are creatures that need the fast moving water. There are um, insects and, um, and snails and so forth that live in the interstices in the sediments that have been deposited um, that contain a little bit of oxygen. So caddisfly nymphs and stonefly nymphs and mayfly nymphs, they, you know, they live in the bottom sediments that have been deposited and that, um, you know, it's not like hard packed clay, but it's a porous kind of environment that protects their little bodies, but still allows them to breathe. So all of that is like the basis of life, really. It's the basis of stream life and, and ultimately the basis of land life too, because without streams running through, um, the land is poor and in some cases pretty much, I don't want to say dead, but I will, I will say dead. Well, I, I appreciate that um, you and I talk a lot about biodiversity. And certainly, as you just mentioned, biodiversity is greatly impacted by the kinds of things that we do to rivers and streams. We have um, agencies, federal agencies, that are dedicated to um, straightening the courses of these rivers for a variety of purposes, including theoretically preventing flooding, theoretically preventing sedimentation, uh, theoretically. Uh, but the impact of dredging, especially around, or not dredging, uh, the impact of straightening the area, especially around places like the Oxbow and West Seneca, what is that impact downstream and and a little bit into the um, into the city of Buffalo and where the uh, Buffalo River enters Lake Erie and the Niagara River? What kind of impact does this kind of work upstream have downstream? Well, in the case of the Oxbow, as I said, you know, the increased velocity of the water, if you channelize the creeks and the tributaries and ultimately the Buffalo River, um, channelizing means not only uh, removing bends in the river and straightening it, but uh, it also means hardening the edge um, so that there's, um, so that you're reducing or even eliminating the floodplain. And um, so uh, channelizing Buffalo Creek uh, involved hardening the edge, putting like a berm along the edge to uh, contain the water. And, um, and downstream, um, same thing, the water is contained in this um, really artificial trough. So the, um, the connection between the water and the land is broken. The habitat for all the creatures that require that, that live in that um, ecotone, that that interstice, that um, that, that uh, uh, I'm trying to think what what do they call it at Waterkeeper, the the living shoreline. You know, the living shoreline. This idea that the shallow water habitat is like so important um, to the fish. Uh, for spawning areas and nursery areas for the little fish. Um, and all that goes away when we, um, when we, when we channelize a river uh, and take out, you know, take out the meanders. And in the case of, um, and then the other problem is when you dredge, you, what do you do with the dredge spoils? Where are you going to put that? And in a way that, that is something in my book that, uh, Stan Spiziak, who was uh, a, a, a sort of the first water protector in our area uh, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, um, he was um, he got Lyndon Johnson here to um, ban. He got Lyndon Johnson here and Lyndon Johnson to do this to to ban open lake dumping of dredge spoils. So you know, dredging to channelize a river. 
also creates this problem of um, dredge spoils. What are you going to do with them? And um, so they're dumped. And they used to be open lake dumped in the in the lake, Lake Erie. Uh, but that was understood finally to be producing um, a real problem in our shallow water areas, Smokes Creek Shoals, all the areas we know along our lake shore, um, were, uh, which were known as significant habitats, aquatic habitats, were, um, we were losing them because, you know, <laughs> physically dredge spoils were just being piled in there, but also, you know, they were, they had contaminants in them from the river. So, um, so that's another problem with dredging. Uh, we only have a few minutes left on this conversation, Margaret, but there's something that there's a lot of really fascinating things in your book. But one of the things that you talk about is the source. And sometimes you describe it as headwaters, forests. Uh, but the Buffalo River shares a source uh, and you've described it as, I think, the water hill. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because that's so interesting that there's such a small area that is actually the source for a number of rivers and creeks that empty into the Lake Erie watershed. So what is the water hill? Where is it? So it's hill made of water is, is my, what I call it. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I, I was trying to understand all of the flow of Buffalo Creek. So going up to the headwaters, where does it begin? Where is the source? The source of Buffalo Creek and Tonawanda Creek and Cataraugus Creek are three main creeks here in, in the Buffalo area or Erie County um, is in Wyoming County, the source. And the source is basically um, a, a, um, a glacial moraine aquifer. So, you know, you have to imagine that the Great Lakes are not just this five bodies of water connected by rivers, but um, they are really its basin. And uh, the Great Lakes are just the visible surface water part of the basin, but the basin itself is a water holding unit. And, um, and the basin goes on, uh, on our side of the lakes, the southern edge of this um, of our basin, the watershed divide is a, is a system of glacial moraines. It's a ridge um, or a, a series of ridges of uh, glacial moraines, which means just piles of debris left behind by the glacier that hold water. They hold uh, glacial water from way back um, and groundwater, um, but also they, they, they hold um, surface water that infiltrates and, um, and these moraine, the, these glacial moraines, which are basically hills of rubble um, with lots of space in, 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 in between in there uh, to hold water. Um, so they're not just watershed divides, they are the source of our water. And there's one particular hill that's part of um, the glacial moraine here um, at the southern end of our streams in, um, in Western New York, that um, off of which, which is, which, uh, so the U.S. Geological Survey has looked at the yield of these aquifers like well and they've um they've characterized them as there are high yield areas and um and middle to high yield areas and and low yield areas and the high yield areas um we are our three streams are sourced on a hill which is a high yield aquifer um meaning um oh god um I can't tell you how many gallons per day, but it's it's um, it's pretty it's a it's a lot. I'll have to look back at my book, um, and so it's a high yield aquifer. And <laughs> the way you can see that on the land is that uh, there's these you know the source of the stream is usually pretty tiny and often invisible. It's hard to find sometimes, but um, here um, just you know, on the north side of the hill, on the west side of the hill, and on the south side of the hill, there are um, three lakes. And these lakes were made by damming this little tiny source water, a little, a little stream um, that was coming off the hill and dammed. And it made Fawn Lake, which is, um, and, uh, and another uh, smaller lake that are at the source of Tonawanda Creek, uh, Java Lake, which is the source of Cataraugus, Creek, 
And um, and then a big, I don't know the name of the lake, but a big lake that's in um, Beaver Meadow Audubon Center. There's, um, there's a big dammed area there. And just looking at the size of these lakes tells you how big, the, you know, how much water there is in this hill, stored in this hill um, and coming off the hill. And, and so, um, so it's a hill made of water. Uh, it's not in good shape. Um, and so that was very disappointing. I seem to find that every time I follow a stream to its source, something bad is happening at the source because people are not aware of, um, of, the, of the sort of magic that's happening underneath the ground. So uh, you often talk about how important it is to protect those sources and you're saying that they're in bad shape. And we know some of them are dammed. Probably all of those three ponds are dammed. Um, what are some of the other bad things that are happening and, and what can we do about it? Well, the main thing um, for um, the areas I just mentioned, you know, um, part of the problem is um, whether or not there's a layer of of, of um, clay or any kind of protective layer over the aquifer. And in this case, um, for those three sources, uh, there isn't. They, those are unconfined aquifers, meaning there's a direct connection with the land use on the surface. Um, and so they are vulnerable. And um, so we really, the main thing we can do is um, is attend to our land use and make sure that we are not burying underground uh, uh, storage tanks uh, for gas and oil and other possible pollutants, that we're not spreading manure from uh, concentrated animal feed operations or CAFOs, um, which we have a lot of uh, over our source. Um, we have to really consider any land use in terms of its potential impact on groundwater, because this is like, this is it. This is our supply. If we break that cycle, we're, you know, we're in trouble. Um, that is that the, the cycle of water coming, you know, landing through rain into on the uh, headwaters and uh, filtering down into the aquifer and, and sourcing our streams. So, um, there are and have been uh, wellhead protection programs. I worked on one of them for the Erie Niagara Regional Planning Board back then. Um, and our job was to go around to towns and villages. And um, the, there were 11 at the time who um, still were getting their water from, ground, from the groundwater, not from Lake Erie. And, um, and the, whole, the whole discussion was about zoning over the recharge areas for these aquifers, doing the proper zoning to eliminate uses that could potentially uh, pollute them. So all of that stuff that happens upstream ends up downstream. And in the cases of these three areas, especially the Buffalo River, it ends up in Lake Erie, which is our water supply, our drinking water supply. And uh, so many uh, communities uh, get their drinking supply from the lakes and the lakes are polluted uh, from everything that you mentioned and including industrial heritage and the agriculture and sewerage. And so learning how to take care of them is so important. But you, you're pointing out in this book that we have this water hill as the primary source is a really important thing for people to know about and talk about. And we're sure it's gonna happen more. And Margaret Wooster, I wanna thank you very much for being with me this morning. The book is called Meander. And you can find it at your local bookstore or you can find it online and we'll put up information as a tag at the end of this. And so uh, maybe we'll have some more conversations, Margaret. I'd like to talk with you more at some point about the Outer Harbor. I know you're doing a lot of work out there trying to protect it and keep it green and public uh, sure. maybe the next time. So thanks for this great book and people buy it, read it. Um, it'll really enlighten you uh, in terms of what's going on here and, and the needs to protect our water supply and our watershed and our Great Lakes. So thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Jay.